Greetings gamers, ex-gamers and friends and family of gamers. Well, it's day 17 and actually, surprise, surprise, this time I actually do have something to report. Uh, yesterday morning I woke up groggy and I found it harder than normal to wake up and get my mind focused to start the day. And yesterday evening, I found myself a little tempted to game in the night. I actually looked at my old PS3 and thought, it's been ever such a long time since I played Civilization Revolution. Then I remembered I wasn't gaming this month and thought, oh well, I'll just watch some TV instead. I was also a little snappy throughout the day uh, and I found myself getting wound up at something that wouldn't normally have wound me up. I found the normal stresses of a normal day just that little bit harder to cope with than normal. Maybe those withdrawal symptoms I've been talking about all month might actually have shown up. Now this brings me to the topic of today's video, which is STRESS! First of all, I'd like to bust a myth that all stress is bad. In truth, there is good stress and there is bad stress. Good stress is otherwise known as acute stress and it's short term. Now some people like to borrow medical terms and use them inappropriately leading to misunderstandings so let's get a few terms out of the way before we discuss further. Uh, medical professionals love to use words like acute and chronic and these days people like to use the words interchangeably to mean bad. Neither acute nor chronic mean bad. In medical parlance, terms like mild, moderate and severe are used instead of good and bad. Uh, acute means it came on suddenly, whereas chronic means I've had it for a very long time. Now acute stress is good for us. It gets our heart pumping, it makes us more alert and floods our system with natural painkillers. This is why people love activities that bring on acute stress, like sports or gambling or video games. Chronic stress, on the other hand, is very bad for us. Living with near constant anxiety causes long-term damage to the cardiovascular system that is to say, the heart, the lungs and the blood vessels. It also causes damage to the gastrointestinal system and also to your immune system. This means people living with constant stress are more likely to fall ill, more likely to develop stomach ulcers and weight problems and more likely to have high blood pressure, heart disease and strokes. More importantly though, chronic stress has been linked to increases in vulnerability to taking up an addiction, maintaining an addiction and is also linked to the increased likelihood to relapse after attempting to quit. Hans Selle is sometimes referred to as the father of stress and his work has fundamentally shaped psychologists understanding of stress in biological organisms. He developed a model for understanding stress known as the General Adaptation Syndrome or GAS or GAS model. According to this model there are three stages of stress. The first stage is called alarm. We become aware of a situation that requires action. After becoming aware of this our circulatory system takes a sudden hit resulting in a sudden drop in blood pressure and blood glucose levels and initiating an electrolyte imbalance. This usually takes less than a second and you will experience it as that startled sensation. Once the situation has been assessed by the limbic system, our fight or flight mechanism that we have already looked at in another video, our body starts gearing up for whatever it might need to deal with. This usually results in an increase in the hormones adrenaline, which Americans will know as epinephrine, and cortisol, which is a kind of glucocorticoid which enhances our level of alertness and reduces inflammation and dulls our pain senses. They also suppress our immune system. As a result, our blood vessels constrict, 
and our heart rate increases to help deliver oxygen and nutrients to the muscles and carry CO2 away from our muscles more quickly. The second stage is called resistance. This is characterised by an increase in glucocorticoids which suppress the parts of the immune system and elevate others and increase the production of red blood cells. It also increases our blood sugar levels as well as the levels of amino acids and fats. Our body is effectively in emergency mode where it is prioritising muscle use. Higher functioning of the brain tends to be diminished in exchange for greater reliance on instinct and intuition. It is in this stage that we tend to try to come up with coping mechanisms to deal with the stress since in modern society we are seldom required to fight or run away and the very thing we need most, our higher executive functions, have been diminished because our body is still designed to help us with sudden life-threatening emergency rather than a tax deadline or examination or performance review. The third stage is either recovery or exhaustion. In the recovery stage, whatever was causing the stress has passed and the body can return to its baseline non-stressed state. If however the reason for the stress hasn't gone away, the body quickly runs out of resources and the body is unable to maintain normal function. In the case where the body is regularly put under stress, or if the stress continues for a prolonged period, the constant high blood sugar levels, reduced blood flow to certain organs, especially the digestive system, and prolonged suppression of the immune system result in long-term illnesses and in the worst cases, critical organ failure leading to death. During the fight or flight response, the higher executive functions, especially those responsible for impulse control, are suppressed. This is understandable, if you are in a life or death struggle, the last thing you need is hesitation, so impulsive actions tend to be more desirable. If blood supply to the executive regions of the brain continues to be diminished, or if glucocorticoids like cortisol remain at high levels, long-term brain damage can occur in areas of the brain responsible for executive functions, such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. In this sense, the stressed person behaves in much the same way as the impulsive person. The same neurological pathways are active, meaning there is diminished resistance to cravings and the high likelihood of picking up, maintaining or relapsing into addiction. To make matters worse, addictions generally have a negative effect on the lives of addicts and those around them. These negative effects can themselves be stress factors, increasing the addict's level of stress, further reducing the addict's ability to make sound judgments and increasing impulsivity, and we have already seen in the previous video where that leads. One concern I have as a gamer is that I know video games can be a cause of stress as well as stress relieving. If we get home from a stressful day, we might have lots of 21st century pressures causing our cave-dwelling adapted bodies to become stuck in stage 2 with high levels of stress hormones making it difficult to concentrate and causing digestive dysfunction and putting a strain on the cardiovascular and immune systems. Entering a video game in an already stressed state puts us into what we feel is a life or death struggle, the outcome of which is usually favourable, kicking our bodies into the recovery stage where our hormone levels can return to normal. In this case, video games can be a healthy way to deal with stress. However, Games are often designed to keep the gamer playing for prolonged periods of time, so gamers might come home from a stressful day, enter the virtual world in the hopes of relieving stress, and the mounting pressure of exponentially increasing number of quests, increasing difficulty in dealing with mobs, toxic teammates, lag spikes, disconnects, bugs and glitches can all result in further increasing the stress levels. If the gamer isn't getting the release from the game, and the game is the only way the gamer knows to de-stress, then the gamer can become stuck in the game 
with mounting stress levels exacerbating the problems. Worse yet, if the gamer then continues to game well past schedule entertainment time such that the gaming results in diminished sleep, this can adversely affect work performance or academic achievement as well as negatively impacting on relationships. These things can add even more stress and if the gaming is the primary or sole coping mechanism for dealing with stress, then the gamer will continue or escalate gaming despite or perhaps because of the negative consequences of gaming. It is this persistence and escalation of gaming, despite the negative consequences, that is one of the identification criteria for gaming disorder in the ICD-11 list published by the World Health Organization. If you feel you might have a problem with excessive gaming and are worried you might be developing an addiction, why not follow along or try out this simple test of going game free for a month? Remember, it can be any month and you don't have to start on the first. Why not post a comment to let me know how you're doing and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. But as for me, big fat hairy 16 days counting non-gamer, I'll look forward to seeing you in another video.